I'll start with the basics. This talk is called From Past Import Print Statement. It is subtitled A Data Ist Rejection of Python 2 versus 3. Today is Saturday, March 11, 2016, and we're at PyData Amsterdam. So I'll get started. Hi, I'm James. Hi, James. <laughs> Hi, I'm James. Hi, James. Very good. If you like this talk, you can uh, follow me on Keybase at DUTC. And also, there may be something wrong with you, because this is probably one of the worst talks I've ever given. And I haven't even given it yet. So I'll start off. Why DUTC? It stands for don't use this code. It's a disclaimer. So anything I show you in this talk, just remember, don't use this code. Some people think it's Dutch, and I have a sticky H key on my keyboard, but that's not what it is. However, I will say I put in close to the bare minimum effort in putting this talk together, including the bare minimum effort in learning about the culture of this beautiful country. So I spent about three minutes Googling about Dutch culture, and I found some interesting things out. I found that we might have some things in common. For example, I found this one web page uh, among the first three hits on Google, because I didn't really want to go any further, about Dutch humor. And here's some phrases I pulled from that. The Dutch have a sense of humor that relishes mishap and mayhem. A whiff of naughtiness and the violation of the odd taboo are common ingredients for a good laugh. The more refined brands of Dutch humor are dry, delight in absurdity, and in turning social values topsy-turvy. And I thought, that's kind of similar to some of the talks I've given in past. In fact, I counted, and I've given a lot of PyData talks in the past. This is the 13th PyData event I will speak at, and the 17th PyData talk I will give. I've spoken at PyData New York four times, PyData Silicon Valley twice, and PyData Boston, I gave three talks. They only had one of those events. I've spoken at PyData London twice, PyData Berlin once, PyData Dallas, PyData Seattle, PyData Amsterdam. That's where we are right now. And it turns out I'm also the vice president of programming at NumFocus. It turns out when they say vice president of programming, they don't mean programming as in writing programs. They mean holding events. Because come on, I'm wearing a suit. I obviously can't code. It also, it also happens that there may or may not be some coincidence between my ability to give so many talks at so many PyData events and also being in charge of the speaker selection committee. Who knows? That's the way things work in this world. I'll tell you, though, that most of my talks are intended to be avant-garde. And this is a term that I choose somewhat carefully. If you were to spend the bare minimum amount of time trying to figure out what avant-garde means, you might go to Wikipedia and you pull out a couple of phrases such as experimental or innovative, or pushes the boundaries of what is accepted as the norm or the status quo. So I'll give you a demo of something that I did last year that I thought was interesting when I first came up with it, and I've gotten somewhat bored of since. I call it R-Watch. Now, unfortunately, there's not a lot of, uh, of Wi-Fi in this room here, so I can't show you how ridiculous this is. But just imagine, I took a bare Python 3.5.0 install, haven't done anything to it, and I pip installed one module, DUTC R-Watch. So if you have Python 3.5.0 running on your computer right now, you can pip install DUTC R-Watch, and you can use my module. Let's see what that module does. Let me start my Python terminal. I have a module called rwatch. And then I can import from sys two things, set rwatch and get rwatch. I wonder what these do. Let's look at the help text. The help text for get rwatch says, it gets the target set with sys.rwatch. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. Let's look at help of set rwatch. Oh, you can set read watches for specified objects. So what I did was I implemented read watches in the, Python, in the C Python interpreter. What's a read watch? Let's say I have a variable x. And every time somebody accesses, looks at that variable x, I want to trigger some callback. I want to look at that. This is a very common thing that we do in debuggers like GDB for languages like C. So I might say, set an R watch. Or let's create a function that takes a frame and an object and just says, I saw some object at some frame and just returns the object. And then I'll set a read watch on this object, and it'll call this function. So every time I look at this object, it calls that function. And if I have another function that maybe returns another function, this is nothing too fancy. And I say h of x, you can see it triggered twice. If I say g of x, it triggered three times. Every time somebody looks at this variable, you trigger. Now, this kind of looks like it might be useful. 
But trust me, it's not intended to be useful. It's intended to shock you, because it turns out that read watches are a generalized form for a lot of things, such as pointers, such as lazy evaluation. And I'll show you my favorite thing that you can do with this. You notice when I set our watch, I gave it a dictionary. Well, I could give it any collection type. So let me, from collections, I'll import default dict. And I'll create my watch function like this. I'll say, if the object I'm looking at is an integer, and it's between 0 and 10, just return, oops, we wrote that wrong. Let's try that one more time. Just return that. And let's just do this. We'll set a read watch so that every time any variable is ever looked, it calls this callback. And now, I broke math in Python, so 1 plus 1 is now 4, 2 plus 2 is now 8, <laughs> x equals 10, x times 2 is, is 40. Whoa, what's going on here? And you can do some really wild and crazy things. Why is x times 2 equal 40? Because the 2 gets changed, but the x doesn't because you can see that you can generalize a lot of things with this. And so this is something that you could do to really provoke somebody that you work with in case <laughs> you just want to have a little bit of fun. And you can see what I mean by avant-garde. Now, one question that you might have is how? Because this might actually seem very useful. In fact, I thought this was something that could be very useful. Let's say that you're writing a Python IDE, your PyCharm, or one of the other many people who are writing Python IDEs, and you say, I want to have a debugger, and I want to have the best Python debugger that can do things that no other debugger can do, that PDB can't even touch. And read watches would be an incredibly useful thing to have in a debugger, because if you have some single data item in a huge pipeline, and you want to figure out why that one data item is throwing errors in some complex part of the pipeline, you just put a read watch, and you see, oh, who's accessing and looking at this data? This is something that we do in GDB with hardware read watches all the time. But I want to show you how I did this, and, and you'll see why this matters. So the way I did this was I went into the CPython interpreter, and I found where you push or pop something from the stack, and I just put a hook on that. So every time a variable gets pushed or popped to the stack, you have a place to put a callback, and you can have a read watch. It's pretty much what a read watch would be. But the neat thing is I showed you I was able to pip install this onto a pure Python 3.5.0. So how on, how on earth do you pip install patches to the CPython interpreter. It turns out it's really easy. A while back, I came up with this thing. It's very, very simple. And it's so simple that I've actually gotten bored of it. But what I do is when you pip install the module, when you load the module, it goes into the running CPython interpreter. It finds where your C eval, rather your pi eval, eval frame x loop is. And it just patches it. It puts a trampoline. So it jumps over to mine, which means with this technique, you can generalize the installation of arbitrary manipulations to a CPython runtime. And I've used this in order to add things like AST literals, um, a, kind of lazy, a kind of eager evaluation to Python, and the demo that I'm going to show you in just a minute. But you can see it's kind of wild. And this is not an approach that you'd ever want to do. You never want to assembly patch a CPython interpreter. But it's something that actually works fairly well in practice. It works on all the systems I've tried that are not Windows, because on Windows, Things work a little bit differently, but on Mac and OS X, sorry, on OS X and Linux, on a CPython interpreter, it's a pretty easy technique. I found other ways to generalize the technique in case you're not able to, for example, find references to the parts you want to overwrite. So it turns out on Linux, you have a proc file system, and you can write through the proc file system. But I don't have time to get into that in this talk. The unfortunate thing is, when I showed this to people, Nobody cared. And in fact, I can see the faces of you right now, and none of you care either. And it was really depressing to me, because I was like, wow, this is something, this is the wildest, craziest, worst thing I've ever done. And people were just like, OK, can I see another talk by Andy Mueller on scikit-learn? <laughs> That's what people care about. And I guess maybe I'm at a PyData event, so people care about things that are PyData related. But this is something that I was interested in. But I will tell you the one thing that people really did care about in one talk that I gave. The strongest reaction I've ever gotten from any talk I've ever given was a result of a tiny throwaway line, a single line that I uttered on stage. I said, the Python core developers are focusing their attention on Python 3. After I gave a talk where I said that one line, I was harangued in a bar for an hour and a half by a gentleman who was offended by the notion that he had to move his code to Python 3. And he kept arguing with me. He kept saying, I don't want to go to Python 3. And he felt so incredibly passionate about it. And I just said, well, you know, this is the way it is. And I'm not part of that political sphere. I'm not a Python core developer. I'm just a hacker who does my stuff on the side. So you know what? I don't care. I don't care about Python 2 versus Python 3. 
There's, th there's parts about Python 2 I don't like. There's definitely parts about Python 3 that I don't think are that good. But, you know, in the end, these are both tools. I enjoy using them, and I don't feel like I have a political stake in the matter. However, I'll tell you who really does care. The people on Hacker News really care about Python 3, and they don't like it at all. And I don't know why that is, but I'll show you one common thing I've seen. Here are a couple of snippets that I got from about five minutes of searching Hacker News Python 3. Somebody says, I was at EuroPython 2 2006 when Guido announced that print statement was getting axed. It was a bit of a shock to me. I miss prints as a statement, especially when I try to debug fast in dummy scripts. Normally, I would agree with you, but one of the epic changes between Python 2 and 3 was a change of print from a statement to a function. If someone would make a Python 2.8, I would pay for it. By the way, I offered to make a Python 2.8 to this person, and they never responded. But <laughs> I really did. If you look, one comment down, that's me. And they said, finally, this Python 2.8 needs to have a print statement. And I like this one the best. You know, we have print, another print, and you can see one is horrific to some people and the other one isn't that much. So let me show you a demo. We, we all work with some person who's like really trying too hard to please people who aren't in their immediate vicinity. So we've all worked with somebody who, in a Python 2 interpreter, this is a Python 2 interpreter, puts, before they write any code at the very top, from future import print state, print function, right? Because, you know, if we have print here as a statement, they do this, and now the only time we can use print is as a function. And if we try and use it as a statement, it barks at us and says invalid syntax. And it's the first thing they write because they really, really want to impress somebody that they're so gung-ho about Python 3. I like Python 3, I use Python 3, but I'm not that gung-ho about it. So I thought, wouldn't it be neat to do this? Here we have a Python 3 interpreter, and we have print as a function. What if we said, from past, <laughs> import <laughs> print statements? Now, it's a little bit ugly, because I actually wrote this code starting from so I was supposed to be here at 10 a.m. yesterday. My flight was delayed nine hours, and I was planning to write my, my talk on the flight, and it didn't quite work out. So I, I wrote this hack from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. this morning. So it's not exactly perfect, but I can do this. It's now a, uh, it's now a statement again. Oops. So now I returned print as a statement the Python language. How about that? And unfortunately, a couple of things don't work. So, you know, in print, you have the two angle brackets. That style, there's no way to really make that work with the way I did this. And you can't, the trailing comma with the print statement, it says suppress the new line. There's no way to make that work either. But it's pip installable. And if you give me a, maybe another evening, I can get rid of the dollar signs. But what you can see is you put dollar signs around print, and now it's a statement again. From past, import, print statement. How about that? And maybe that'll make those people on Hacker News finally, finally, a little bit less upset about Python 3. But the real thing that I like about this is the question of how does it work? One of the first C Python hacks that I ever released to the wild was called Did You Mean? And I'd seen a post on Hacker News about somebody who wrote this Did You Mean in Ruby, and they just overrode like method missing, and every time you type, mistype a method, it, it suggested the right one. And I, th I said, could you do this in Python? And I was able to do it in Python. It's on GitHub as well. But I tried to find the most perverse, impossible to guess way to do it. And it's a really wild way to do the approach. And you'll see the same thing here. In order to get the print function to work, what I did, this is my past module. All it does is it reaches up in one inspect frame and it replaces your normal print function with my print function here. And that seems fairly innocuous, except in order to do that, what I did was I rewrote the Python grammar so that you can add arbitrary syntax extensions. So you want new syntax in Python, you can just add it. You can add arbitrary syntax extensions with anything after. So basically, any keyword followed by any expression list, just add it to Python. You say, oh, I want something like a width statement. I want a width statement that sees the entire context of the block. You can use that to do it. And you know what I did with it? I added print as a statement back to Python 3. How about that? Isn't that the most awful thing you've ever seen? I've added arbitrary Python syntax extensions. You can extend the language in any way that you want. Any keyword plus an AST, you can create syntax around that. Of course, there are certain syntax like block syntax. You'd have to extend this a little bit to add. But this is, this is pretty good for about four hours of work in the morning. 
by the way, this is a horrible idea. This is about the worst idea I've come up with. Please do not use this code. There are many amazing things you could do with it that you shouldn't do because this is not a good idea. And you know what? I love this. There's something delightfully subversive about this. When somebody comes to you and they say, I want you to add print back to Python 3 as a statement, and you find not the most immediate way, because that's an easy patch. You just find all the places they change and you patch it back in. No. You find the worst possible way you could do it, just to show them what a stupid idea they have. And this is kind of the core of Dadaism as I understand Dadaism, that it's beyond avant-garde, it's a rejection of, of ideology. It's about rejecting logic, embracing chaos and irrationality. It's a certain perverse, nihilistic, self-destructive mode of existence. And so the question is why? Why would I even do this? Because this is clearly not related to what I do at work, hopefully. Otherwise, none of you would ever want to work with me, right? But I find some perverse pleasure in these kind of things. And I'd like to share with you, at the end of my presentation, some of the motivation that I have here. Because I know you don't care, and it's okay with me. You know, I, I've gotten used to, you know, you show some neat stuff on screen and nobody really cares. It's okay, I'm not worried about it. But I like the nihilism. I hope you can appreciate with me the nihilism and the absurdity of trying to implement something like this in the worst way possible. And I kind of see this as a motivation. I think it kind of makes me an artist. And it's not a term that I use in order to self-indulge or to self-aggrandize. It's more as... This is just kind of, I feel some innate desire towards doing perverse thing with programming languages, such as Python, and seeing where they take you. Finding the worst, most ridiculous ways to, to accomplish a task, to pervert the assumptions and expectations that people bring to you, such as adding print as a statement back to Python 3. And, and this is kind of the motivation that I have in a way that I contextualize a lot of the talks that I've given. In, in this mode, I, I, kind of, I kind of see this as a self-destructive technical absurdity. And I hope that maybe over time, I can find people who appreciate this same almost artistic motivation. Because it's not anything you'd ever want to use for work. It's a way to indulge in an intellectual exercise. And the saddest thing is, if I'm calling myself an artist, I'm already in costume. And I don't mean the kind of postmodern costume that we all wear because we're all disaffected and alienated by modernity. I mean, I'm actually literally in a costume. I'm the only guy here in a suit. So, in conclusion, I'm the lamest artist ever. <laughs> I hope you like my talk. This is from past in poor print statement, a Dada's rejection of Python 2 versus 3. I'm James Fowles. Thank you very much. Any questions or additional art? <laughs> uh, so, do you think that um, you could uh, make Python look like Pro, so Booking.com can start writing Python everywhere? <laughs> we yes, thank you very much, please. <laughs> Asking for a friend. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. I think they're sponsors of this event, so we should say very nice things about them. We should be very careful to say nice things about them. <laughs> we can do worse, though. We can do worse. We, can, I could, we could do, you and me, Geo, we could do the worst things you could even imagine in Python. And if somebody says, oh, wouldn't it be nice to add this to Python? We can find ways to make them regret it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Have you thought about adding a switch test statement as an effective way of offending even more people? I already have a switch statement in Python. So what is a switch statement? It's pattern matching. So I have an example, maybe I can dig it up if we have time, where I implemented a switch statement using try accept. I'm sure I have it in my scratch folder. Scratch, Python, vim, switch. Here we go. So I already have a switch statement. This is it. I came up with this a long time ago. You can see it's a switch case, and it uses the try accept mechanism in order to implement pattern matching. How about that? I already did it. <laughs> Isn't this the worst possible way to just... To, to, I, but my favorite part is when you show it to people, you just kind of cover up the right-hand side with your hand, so they just see the left-hand side. Or sorry, the... Uh, you cover up the left-hand side, they can see the right-hand side. Other questions? Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been an amazing event so far, and I think we're leading into the break, so thank you very much.